All right, we are good to go. Okay. Um, my name is Dr. Nar Dove, and I have the great honor of beginning the African Womanism series, um, which it will be a collection of uh, meetings and conversations with beautiful, wise African women. So it's a great honor for me to um, sit with Dr. Margaret Busby, who wrote uh, African uh, Daughters of Africa and New Daughters of Africa, two books that bring together the stories, the uh, thoughts, the poetry of 400 women beginning with the ancient times until now, young women who are now going into the literary world with their ideas. Um, and I am also in, very honored to be interviewing um, Michelle B. Taylor, who is also known as Feminista Jones, and who um, whose book, um, Re, please. Reclaiming uh, our space, <laughs> no worries. I've read it, I know it, you know, it's I'm good. just terrible at remembering things, but thank you so much for helping me. I hope you'll both help me throughout all of this, but um, really, um, Michelle, B. Taylor is a person who is very knowledgeable about social media. So much of her activism is inside the social media uh, terrain. Um, much of Dr. Busby's work is in the literacy, literature um, field where she is known um, across the African world. Um, as a publisher, as a person who decides uh, on publications and is called to many committees to do with uh, literature and sits on these committees and develops awards. She's often asked to award people uh, for their wonderful works and has just received a lifetime award in the literary field herself just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I'd like to begin with why we're here. Um, we're in Temple, we're, we're coming from Temple with the Department of Africology. And I was, uh, uh, I, was interviewed and hired to um, open up avenues of thought and focus around African women. And um, the discipline itself is very, uh, is always developing and growing. And uh, for some time, the story of women has not been in the focus. It's been in the background and that is across the world. So it's not just, been happening to um, Africology. But Africology as a discipline, which is underpinned by um, Afrocentric theory, is very important because it is the only discipline that um, loves African people, that is grounded in the love of African people, African humanity, and everything pertaining to Africa can be uh, interrogated um, analyzed in uh, the discipline. And a unique feature of the discipline is that it stands alone because it stands in as, uh, as a challenge to and, defi and in defiance of other disciplines that are grounded in the belief in African inferiority uh, who have been part of the construction of lies about Africa and African people. And um, 
disciplines that have grown up and been subscribed to through the profits of African people colonized and enslaved the blood of African people. So there are these two types of disciplines. Sometimes they actually are one and the same. And we stand to correct and change and develop the truth about what Africa is and who are the people that came out of Africa. And um, so the discipline itself is like no other. And people often mix it up with sociology or anthropology or psychology and so on. But no, it, it, it is its own discipline. And out of it, we have developed ideas um, that link the black woman, man, child, black humanity to culture, to the culture of Africa from the ancient times until now. So this is about um, remembering the cultural memory and using truth to help people to know what Africa really is and who they really are. And uh, these other disciplines have been developed to deny the humanity of African people and to profit from monies made out of the lands and work uh, uh, and skills and knowledge of African people. So this is just in a, to sort of show you that we are our own discipline. So in looking at culture, we understand that the cultural construction of patriarchy um, happened thousands of years ago and, and stands within uh, modern religion. So you can read them today and find uh, early debasement of African women as morally bankrupt and problematic. This is the mother of humanity and the African man in the same way. So, and these ideas have justified the uh, demonization of the African woman and the demonization of the African man. We're, we are now living in cultures that believe in these ideas and teach us when we go to school in these beliefs about the uh, inferiority of the black woman and the black man. And here we're focusing on the woman because as Malcolm X said, as, um, as Michelle has pointed out in her book, uh, that the woman really is the one that is the most debased in this society. So this society is guilty of uh, debasing women and men, but in particular, the African woman. And the construct of race, another falsehood, is also embodied in these early religious texts. And... Um, so we've got the falsehood of patriarchy and the falsehood of race, and we live inside that. And without knowledge of who we really are, we're sort of trapped in paradigms that uh, offer no solution to our futures because they are constructed by those who have conquered us and taken away everything that is meaningful to African people, whether it's the wealth of the lands, or the knowledge that was produced thousands of years ago, all these things have been taken. And Africology is a discipline that recognizes that all the people that work in Africology, all the students, professors, are walking towards the new, um, a, a defining a different way uh, and developing truth in many, many forms. And we're very proud of that. So I'm going to um, introduce first Dr. Margaret Busby to really ask her, uh, I use Dr. Busby's books in my Black Woman course because they are a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Dr. Busby is, has published many, many 
many, many works, but these works for the young African woman or the older African woman um, have helped us to, to realize that the black woman is a global woman that she has through these common cultures of anti-black and anti-woman um, have suffered in the same ways, even though we might be here, when we look across the world, we see it's the same treatment and we understand that it's cultural and that is the connection amongst all these people that are doing this. And so I'd like, um, you know, um, Margaret, it's Dr. Busby, it's in part about you, who you are, and why, why did you choose to write these, to edit, to bring all these women together in this work? Well, we have to go back to the late 1980s when I was very conscious of the fact that there were not enough women of African descent been given the credit for creativity as they should have been. There, you know, you would find anthologies of you know, poetry from the West Indies, and they wouldn't say by men, but all the contributors would be men or mostly men, or you know, short stories from Africa, it wouldn't say by men. And yet, you know, there would be few women in, in, in included in these volumes. So I, I wanted to kind of remedy that as well as to remedy the fact that you were getting the impression that there was just a handful of women of African descent who were, who were writing. And there, were, there were the names who were coming to the fore. We know about Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou and, and Alice Walker. Those were the names that were being talked about in, in, in that era, in the, in the 80s mostly. And they were, they were African-American. And you would have thought that there were no other women of African descent writing anywhere. And they were meant to sort of represent the whole world through the generation. So I wanted to just try and say, well, those are wonderful writers. We're talking about the few that were getting the attention, but there are so many more who you should know about. So I put together Daughters of Africa, which came out first in, in Britain in 1992, which had more than 200 women of African descent through the generations, as you said, starting from ancient Egypt and going right up to the present day. And they were writing in every genre. They were from every part of the world. I, I remember meeting people. I, I, I went to a party once and I met a woman. I was introduced to her. I thought she was from Nigeria, perhaps. But she started talking. She was from Turkey. And so I realized uh, that there were as an African presence in Turkey and, and she contributed to the anthology. So I was trying to show that around the world, there was a presence of African women, which was so creative, it is, deserved attention. So that was the starting point. And that book came out in 1992, as I said, and you know, fast forward to 2019, and I produced another compilation of another more than 200 women of African descent again around the world, and I could do the same tomorrow. There are just so many creative women who do not necessarily get the spotlight they should shone on them. So that, that, was, that was the motivation behind what I was doing. Thank you very much for that. And, um, you know, and, and it does affect the students very greatly because part of the work that they have to do for me is to find women that they can who inspire them so it's very interesting the choices that they make because I get to know the students through the course courses and then it's really lovely to see the people the women that they actually admire and uh, you know so just from that vantage it's it's, it's a very exciting thing and I, I'm so glad because Quite often, you know, students don't often, they don't realize the value sometimes of the works that they're looking at until they actually open the books and actually read the stories. So mm. um, thank you. And um, Michelle, you, you've taught in my class. It's not just about my 
us at all. But, <laughs> you know, and you found yeah. that a wonderful book on reclaiming yeah. us. And it's it's a brilliant book. And um, you know, you you work in the social media and that's where your activism lies. Can you, um, you know, just talk about what made you, you know, decide to to publish inside that arena? Thank you, Dr. Dev, and um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Buzzy, for that work. Because I was really thinking about the, the similarities between what you're doing and what I was trying to do with uh, reclaiming our space. And it's naming and claiming these women that have done this tremendous labor and work, you know, throughout time that never get recognized. And we don't know their names. We know something happened, but we don't know their names. So that's really what I was trying to do there. And just a slight correction, Dr. Dove, is that I, I'm, a, I'm an older lady too. You know, I was an activist before social media was a thing. And I try to let people know what I write about in the book is that, you know, social media has become a tool for a lot of us activists, right? So if you think about when they were organizing the March on Washington and writing letters and telegrams and things like that, it took organize and get people together. It's kind of how we use social media. It's, and it's like, I look at Twitter as like a telephone or things like that, because it's just another way to reach more people. And so when I started getting involved with that, I was like, this is really powerful. In 2013, I wrote an art article, you know, asking is Twitter the underground railroad for, you know, black activism, because it was become, it was clearly becoming a space where we could meet and talk about this is, you know, we're talking about Oscar Grant and, and these other people that were being killed by the police who we would not know about if it was not for social media. So I started asking that question then. And then some of uh, my colleagues, Dr. Merrick Clark and some others started talking about the, the importance of Black Twitter, so to speak, as a meeting space and a gathering space for these, these thinkers and these activists and these scholars and that kind of thing. And so um, when I was writing Reclaiming Our Space, I was really thinking like, how do I make sure that the people that I know get their just due? How do I tell these origin stories about things? How do I, how do I make sure that we don't forget? So for example, when everybody talks about Black Girl Magic, that's actually my friend Kashan who came up with that, right? And for many years, people just er completely erased her from the narrative of this idea of, you know, that it was actually originally Black Girls Are Magic, right? Um, and it got shortened, of course, for marketability. And now everybody's talking about this in every new TV show, it's everywhere. But this woman for the longest time was never getting any credit for this. And she's a poor black woman from DC. You know, like she was a single mom, teen mom, like, you know, it just all these kinds of things that I was just like, why is this woman being erased? Um, you know, I, there, was, there were people that I included in the book that I was just like, you all need to know what these women's contributions have been to the advancement of our people, to liberation of our people, to liberation of women, just, you need to know that. And so that's really why I have interviews in there. Um, I do some documentation about the origins of things, even down to something like, you know, um, when people use Twitter and they connect their tweets to make threads, what they call threads, the mass media credits a white man for that. It's not a white man who came up with that. It was a black woman. And in my book, I talk about because of how Africans communicate with call and response and things like that, we have dominated that particular form because it's built for call and response. So I, I really kind of dig into those things to make sure that people know black women, African women, we did this, <laughs> you know, and we did these things. And now that everything is so popular now, um, even to you seeing hashtags on television shows and movies and people saying, join us and use this hashtag, that came from black women, that came from African women and African American women, that came from us. So I just wanted to make sure in my book that I started covering you know, the ways in which we have contributed to popular culture, to social activism, to this historical narrative and documenting people who are outside of the academy, but who are producing knowledge, right? They are that every single day, these women are online creating knowledge, theorizing on like just brilliant things, but because they exist outside of the academy, because they don't have book deals, because they don't get published, their work is not given the credit or the, the, the support that it deserves and doesn't make the knowledge that they're producing any less valuable. So I just, I wanted to cover that in the book. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Michelle. Um, I also noticed, um, just a point, um, that through the development of social media, that there are communities from your book that have developed where 
women undergoing trauma, which is most mm -hmm. whoever, whoever they are, um, most African women um, can meet and have mm -hmm. discussions about their situations and uh, collaborate with other women and, and develop mm -hmm. knowledge that can be useful. So there's- this Absolutely. Absolutely. Like um, bystander intervention, for example, resurfaced and has been developed through primarily um, some of the work that I've done with my campaign, UOK Sis, which is addressing um, street harassment. And um, now everybody's talking about bystander intervention that centers victims, which is what I was talking about um, in my work. So yes, we are producing these actions. We are producing these ways of being that other people are taking now and saying, oh, this is actually brilliant. We'll use it too. Um, and conveniently erasing <laughs> the people who are the, the architects of those things. But it's okay. It's all right. You it's know, we just know it. We talk about it here. Hey, we know it. <laughs> Yeah, every, everything, everything Michelle says resonates so, so much with me. I mean, it is that thing about collaboration, about supporting each other, about showcasing each other and, and mm -hmm. learning from each other. And, and what I find really interesting is how many people were influenced by what they read in the first volume, of the first anthology I published in 1992, to become writers and to co yeah. continue writing. And they are now in the second volume. And... It's that continuation. It's, it's like that the chains, you know, the links of a chain, and, and we're all stronger because we, we see each other and we, and we, you know, we raise each other's profile. It's, it's, it's that saying about a, a river, a stream cannot rise higher than its source, mm -hmm. and women are the source of the family. So mm -hmm. we have to be there uplifting the whole community, if you like. And I, I mm -hmm. think it's necessary that it's, it's, it's not a question of competing with each other. With each mm -hmm. other. We are supporting mm -hmm. each other, showing what is best about being a, an African woman mm -hmm. and celebrating that in, in whatever way, whatever the rest of the community says. And we are central to our own lives. We're not marginal, we're central. Mm -hmm. we're Absolutely. Center. Somebody mm -hmm. sent me a picture of my book on a bookshelf and they wanted to show it to me, but I was way more happy that my book was next to all these other African women and their oh. books on similar topics. I said, that's all I ever wanted was we should be able to walk into a bookstore and see all of our work right there and that have multiple options of who we can pick up, who we can read, different perspectives that we can get instead of like them picking one person at a time and saying, right. this is the only person that's allowed to talk about this or, you know, that kind of thing. So, so starting to see that it's like, on some levels, we're all we got. We have to do that, right? Um, and and that's how, you, like you said, it raises the profile and it generates more interest in the work that we're doing, and um, it brings us all to the center. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much. And I I now, um, in terms of the activism, I I, I remember Dr. Busby that um, you were the youngest and the first black woman publisher uh, in partnership with um, Alison, I think. Um, mm, that's the name of my partner, Claire Alison, yeah. Yes, and you published books that were not publishable by the status quo. Well, we published, yeah, I, I suppose I can't escape that label. The UK's <laughs> youngest and first black woman publisher, and that's fine, but the, I, I, I'm always, keen to stress the fact that okay I started publishing in 1967 believe it or not and the year before I started there was the first black publisher in Britain who was called John LaRose who started New Beacon Books and two years after I started Jessica Huntley of Bogle Louverture started the publishing company and we were all supportive of each other we were all friends we were, I mean Jessica and John were like a generation ahead of me but we were all working to make sure that we publish things that other publishers were not necessarily publishing. Um, not to say that we weren't publishing good books by writers who were not African, as well as African, and, and good, good books by men as well as women. So I, I, I published people such as Bucci and Machetta. I also published people like uh, Ishmael Reed. I, I published a variety of people. And I was, it was again, trying to publish what we thought ought to become better known. And it also involved bringing back into print things that had gone out of print, things were 
it was a sort of erasure, things that were had been written and were no longer available. So I published a writer, for example, called C.L.R. James, who was actually a, a family friend. He was at school with my father. And the majority of his books were out of print, including his most important book to my mind, The Black Jacobins. So I reprinted that in Britain. So it was a question of rescuing books as well as discovering books and just trying to make the whole literary canon richer and to make sure that we as Africans, we as, as women, we as literary people had our own place in, in that world. And, and I always go back to the fact that, that, that one of the people who had a great influence on me, I didn't necessarily know it at the time. I was at school and I used to get a literary journal every week. And on the cover of one issue of a journal called John of London's Weekly in 1961, it was this photograph of an African woman called Noni Jababu, a big photograph. She'd had a book reviewed. She just published a memoir. And that made a lasting impression on me because it made me aware that you could be an African woman and have a central place in, British lit in the British literary world. And that is an example that, I stay that stayed with me for the rest of my career. And I hope that similarly, people will be inspired and I, I know how people have said that but the fact that I, I did that did did manage to start a publishing company even though I was young and you know idealistic and knew nothing and had no money but I managed to do it and, and so other people can now think well if it's, it's it is possible to do it if she did it so can we thank you very much Dr Busby that is so true and thank you for clarifying um, the need to remove the label of the youngest uh, black woman. You don't have to. <laughs> at, at the time, I was the, I was the youngest in the country. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now probably the oldest. <laughs> on, this, on this Zoom thing, I'm probably the oldest. <laughs> well, you're competing with me, but I know that we're not competing, so I, I shan't state anything about that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Michelle, I um, saw that your activism with the Black Lives Matter, how important that was in your book. I, you know, because you're, you're a humble person, you're a student in the department, one of our best students in the department. Thank you. And, uh, you know, there are lots of things that we don't know about you that we can find in your book, which is... <laughs> So I wondered if you could, um, you know, just talk about that, just your involvement with it, with deep and Yeah, um, you know what? I don't like Black Lives Matter as an organization. I'll say that. Um, I wrote about it because I think it's important to talk about um, uh, how things came to be. So again, I'm all about origin stories, right? Um, and so in, in that I talk about how the actual hashtag Black Lives Matter started with uh, Mark Anthony Hunter, uh, who did not get credit for starting the hashtag, right? Um, but there's been this like kind of narrative that's been created around the popularization and the use of it. Um, my issue with the organization is that I just don't think that it did the work that it needed to do in terms of redistribution of funds that it received, right? And that's a huge critique. But what it did do was change the conversations around activism today and really gave people a vehicle to bring to light a lot of the stuff that was going on in their own communities. And so there are Black Lives Matter um, chapters around the country. It, very, it operates as this kind of like decentralized satellite kind of thing where people can use this powerful you know, name and concept to kind of guide the work that they are doing. But it's the same activism that we've been doing for centuries, right? And so it all falls in line with work that our ancestors have been doing towards the liberation of our people. It just so happens that within the last it's almost 10 years at this point, um, you know, it, it's, it's a rallying point. It's a, like we talked about earlier, a meeting space for people to come in. Um, I have a lot of critiques of Black Lives Matter, particularly that it is led by people who claim to be Black Marxists and there's no such thing. So, you know, I have an issue with that. I have an issue with the multi-million dollars that they've generated that many of these satellite groups have never seen. I have a number of critiques. But what I will say is that, you know, for those of us who were, again, who were activists before social media, we've never seen an explosion 
of, of conversations around the activism that people have been doing to this end outside of what's happening with this Black Lives Matter um, movement. And so you're seeing um, demonstrations, right, that are just huge, hundreds of thousands of people just showing up. Um, one that I organized in 2014, probably the largest one in modern history related to fighting against police brutality, right? You could never see something like that if there wasn't this, this idea of Black Lives Matter. So for me, I mean, fundamentally, I think that when you have to assert Black Lives Matter, you're almost internalizing the idea that our lives don't matter and that you need to assert it. And I don't have to assert that to anybody. I don't care who you are. And also, I'm not trying to convince Europeans of anything. Like, we are who we are. But, but, as we have learned, and I've learned from my professors that are in this Zoom, we have to kind of locate people where they are, right? We have to understand that people are working within the confines and, 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 and dealing with trauma that they have had, and they're working with the knowledge that they have. And we have all been educated in these very racist, right, ways, in these very patriarchal ways. And so the efforts that we produce are really in a reaction to those things. So when I look at Black Lives Matter, it's like, I can critique it from this lens because I've had you know, more exposure and I've been able to think a lot differently. But what I can also say is that for hundreds of thousands of people, it has been the, the thing that has gotten people to kind of open their eyes a bit and wake up to the realities of the experiences that African people have been having around the world. And that's super important. And so I will, I will give them that. So I think you can separate the movement and the concept from the actual organization and figures and things like that, um, because there are some problems with that. But there have always been problems <laughs> within um, these kinds of organizations that we've had. We could go back to the 60s and look through a lot of the conflicts and the issues that people have had and infiltration and all those kinds of things. But ultimately, we want to believe that the goal was for our people to be liberated. And so we do extend a bit of grace in that regard. Um, so my, my work really has been about how can we galvanize people? How can we use social media and these new technologies to reach people and convince them that you have to work together. We have to do better. We have to keep fighting. We have to keep moving. And that's really what I think the Black Lives Matter movement is more about. Like, here are these issues. Here's ways that we can address them. Let's do this collectively. And, and when you say, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And when you say about the issues that we've had, betrayals and so mm -hmm. on, um, that take place, um, for the for Africology, when we center on the idea of culture, we we can see how um, culture influences uh, the way we think, the way we act, the way we behave, and live our lives, and that is a constant sort of imposition on our minds, and mm -hmm. really alienates us so much from our true selves, from our cultural selves, which are which culturally we're almost the opposite. But if we have no knowledge, we can never know that. We can never reach back, mm -hmm. connect, we can never remember any of these things, which are part of the uh, problems with you know the works mm -hmm. that that are done mm -hmm. with you and, and, and uh, Dr. Busby. Mm -hmm. so, um, you, I wanted to go back to uh, Dr. Busby when you, um, you know, came out of Africa as a Ghanaian and, um, you know, what you saw what you felt that you could, uh, you know, because when when did you become an activist in your own head? That there were things that you you perceived. I don't think I ever really think of myself or thought of myself as an activist. I was doing things that I believed in, that based on ideals I had, but um, it wasn't that I set out to. Um, I didn't engage in activism. I think because I, what I was doing as a publisher, I began doing when I was really quite young. And I think I have to say that, okay, coming out of Ghana or the Gold Coast, as it was when I was born, 
I was really influenced by the culture of my family, for a start, and my family included people who'd come back to Africa from the Caribbean, from the West Indies. Like I was born in Ghana, and so was my mother and my mother's mother, but my father was actually born in Barbados. And he, as a child, moved to Trinidad. So he grew up in Trinidad. He won a scholarship. He came to Britain. He studied, as, became a doctor, worked in Britain, and then migrated to Ghana in 1929. And my mother's father was born in Dominica, and he studied law in Britain, and he migrated to Ghana in 1902. So I had this Pan-African feel within my family, and the whole concept that Kwame Nkrumah had of Pan-Africanism is something that in informed my, my life, my personality, what I was doing. And so in a way, it was kind of unconscious activism, if you like. It, it wasn't something I set out to impose. It was just, to me, what ha had to happen, what was natural. So, you know, I was publishing C.L.R. James because he was an important person to publish. I was publishing Buche Macheta, who was a young Niger West African woman from Nigeria. And we were two, she was about the same age as I, I was when I started publishing her. And she was writing about what it was like to deal with the struggles of, of raising five children on her own in Britain as an African woman. So I was trying to get her story out of the, out there. I was doing things because there were things I believed in, but they were, they were not things that I classed as activism. In retrospect, I can, I can say, or I can see, and, and you, you can say it <laughs> um, back to me that I, I was engaging in some sort of activism, but I, I, I was also connecting with people who were much more consciously activists, who, because they were, they were much more, they were older than I were, were they, they were politically involved. As I've mentioned, John LaRose, who was from Trinidad, he, he, he became a publisher and activist in Britain. He was a friend of mine. Jessica Huntley, she was from Guyana. She was an activist before she came to Britain with her husband, Eric Huntley. And these were people who I was connecting with, learning from, working with. And that sort of activism is something is, that I found quite dear to my heart. And, and when, for example, Jessica New Beacon Books, Vogel Louverture, and another black organization called the Race to Date Collective began something called the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books, which ran annually from 1982, I think, um, to the mid 90s, I, I was very involved with that. So it was uh, activism through what I was doing in the literary field. And that to me is important because I think everything that you do can have a political connotation. So that's a lesson that I, I took with me from the earliest involvement I had with publishing. Thank you very much, so interesting. And um, back to you, Michelle. Um, you you have told part of your story as well, how you have identified really very much with uh, many of the women who come to seek your advice and women that you actually connect with and try to support in different ways. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I think... You know, I'm, I'm coming from social work, right? I'm coming from a social work background. And one of, you know, people ask how did I get into social work as well, because I was born into Americans, America's poverty and I experienced a lot of the um, sy symptoms and outcomes of American poverty, hunger, homelessness, all those kinds of things. And I knew from a young age that I wanted to help other people. And so I got into social work and I really got into um, mental health. And, and part of why I got into mental health is because I wanted to... Um, I wanted to figure out like why people were calling some things disorders when I was growing up learning they were gifts, right? Or why are black people being assessed in ways that white people are not? I'm like, we're not like them. So why are you saying that we have these same? I was very much interested in that. Like I was like, what is what does it mean to have schizophrenia? So you hear voices. What's wrong with hearing voices? Like how do you know that that person is just not special? They don't have a gift that was passed down to them from the ancestors. Like I was very, at a young age, was very curious about that. So I really got into studying mental health, but then that really became about how our, um, our country 
uh, treats people with mental health issues and, and, and things like that. So that led me to becoming a counselor and kind of working with folks and getting, especially into domestic violence space. And that's where you see a lot of women uh, coming and seeking support and things like that. And so that is really um, how I kind of got into this space of being like, like, how do we bring you know, women together? How do we bring African women together for healing and community and sisterhood and building? Um, how do we allow them to have space to be vulnerable, to talk about the heaviness that they carry from all of these other uh, burdens and things like that, where they feel like they can't talk about it necessarily in their houses of worship, within their family meetings, in their communities, whatever, they just need that space to talk to other people who, who get it, right? Um, and I think personality wise, I've kind of always been a bit of a convener. I like putting together events. Uh, Toyo's been to some of my, you know, I, I like bringing people together because I feel like it's in, when we're in community that we are the strongest. And so I, I started identifying ways to create community for women to come together and talk about a lot of these traumas that we've experienced and kind of really talk about the history of where it comes from, but also the here and now and how like the only way we're going to overcome these things as a community is if we understand the sources of it, but also like how it's affecting us now. And um, it's been so rewarding and, and, and fruitful over time, but also very painful and very hard to deal. And you're somebody who's empathetic and you're sitting in a room of sisters that are just, each one of them has been violently abused and all these kinds of things. It's heavy. And you're just like, what is going on? Why? Like, you know, it's, it's really heavy, but the work continues. And my my goal is to make sure that I can continue to create these spaces and these conversations so that people can even just speak their truth. Because we're, you know, we're talking about the truth. You, you're, walk, you're going 20 years, 30 years, never having told anybody that these certain things have, have harmed you. You're, that's, you're passing that on to other people. You're carrying that with you. It's not what you need. So um, if I can do anything to facilitate those conversations, and also, like I said, bring kind of some of my therapeutic expertise um, I focus on sisters. That's, that's, that's it for me. Like, I'm not saying that brothers don't need the help. I, they do. I, you know, and I think that there's spaces that can be created for them. But for me, my, and especially as a mom, like, I just feel like my priority is really to focus on the mothers of our community and the women of our community right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and, you know, some of the incidents and things that you point out in your book are really things explained in Dr. Busby's books, which I found very interesting because many, you know, it doesn't mean that because uh, African women are able to write their stories that that puts them in a different sort of level of they're educated, they're this, that, and the other, because the trauma that these women have been able to express um, is really deep. And that's one of the amazing things uh, about the stories that you have collected, Dr. Busby, in these books that open up the readers to experiences that they may have had themselves or to at least understand well, I mean, with my students anyway, they, they have talked about some of the experience in, in, your, in your works that have really been stronger. So I think there's sort of a, a cross thing going on, even though you come from two different um, areas of expertise, that uh, the stories of women, Black women, African women are deeply linked to both of your experiences. Yeah. I'd like to say that in, in New Doors of Africa, the, the, the volume that came out in 2019, I didn't curate it in any way. I didn't approach women and tell them what I wanted them to write about. I, as, as you know now, because I, I did ask you to write something and you did contribute a wonderful piece yourself. But I wanted to give women the freedom to say what they wanted, how they wanted, in whatever form they wanted. So if I approached, for example, a novelist, it wasn't because I expected her to write something that fitted in with that genre that everybody expected. So quite often I'd get something from somebody in a form they hadn't shown to the world before. So it was that giving, giving the contributors that freedom to express themselves, to express 
whatever it was about their lives they thought was interesting or, or informed his or, or they wanted to get off their chests, if you like. And to me, that was really quite an enlightening thing to do. And the other thing that I, I found really impressive was the fact that we wanted this anthology to have a, some sort of legacy. So when I approached the women, I made it quite clear that we were not necessarily going to be paying them huge sums of money for their contributions. And everybody said, that's fine. And because of that, everybody waived their fees and we were able to set up this scholarship, which meant that a woman student from Africa could go to London University School of African and Oriental Studies and have a free course of study and accommodation because of this anthology. And to me, that was just a really remarkable display of how sisterhood should be working. It's not that I want something for myself, but I want to pass on something to another sister or, or a mother or an aunt, or a, a niece. We were sharing something amongst us all and enabling the next generation perhaps to find their own place in the literary world. So that, that's what I'm, I'm, I hope is happening with New Daughters of Africa. Well, I, I th you know, thank you, Dr. Busby. I, I found that an amazing, um, just amazing that you would think of this idea, I think of you as a visionary, that you would think of this idea to publish a book that would ultimately bring somebody from Africa, or an African woman to study freely. Um, and it was, uh, everybody who contributed to that felt really great about being part of that. And, it, and, you know, but the interesting thing is that it was thought of that it could be that. And, uh, you know, so I, I thank you for being able to see how it could help the women and how the women themselves in the stories in the book contributed to, you know. And helped each other. I, I, I think that's, that's what I find amazing. In, in fact, if I do another anthology, Michelle, I'd love you to be in it. <laughs> Thank you, that's so kind, oh my goodness. But there Thank are you. just <laughs> so many amazing voices and we're not necessarily only talking about formal literature, as you said, or, or yeah. educated types of writing. Because the first volume, for example, starts with a whole section on oratory, spoken mm. word. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it was involving all sorts of creativity with words, with writing. So you know, whether it's a letter, mm. or a, a political writing, a poem, an extract from a novel, a short story, I wanted to have the contributors to have the freedom to say what they want to say, however they want to say it. And, mm -hmm. I, and I hope that's that's contributes to making this book enjoyable for whoever picks it up. Yeah, and I'm thinking about accessibility. Like well, even with my book, it didn't come out in hardcover because that would have cost too much. And I didn't want the book to be more than $15 because I wanted people to be able to access it. I also pushed for libraries to buy it so that people could go and get it from libraries because I wanted it to be something that like a 14 year old could read on the bus on her way to school and a 75 year old could read in the comforts of her home. I wanted it all to be, you know, just accessible because we, there's so much of the, the conversations that we have that maybe go undocumented, right? That doesn't mean that they are not any less valuable contributions to our liberation and to the, our, the liberation of our consciousness, the expansion of our consciousness. And so being able to capture those things, especially now with the technology that we have, right? We are using more video. We are, you know, we tell, tell everybody, record your elders while they're still here so that we can keep those, this digital humanities that people now are really able to meet in these digital spaces and kind of go over these archived documents and, and, and recordings and things like that. It's really changing the way we understand how our people have existed around the world for all these, you know, centuries. And it's just truly fascinating. And honestly, it's women that are like really, really leading the charge and making sure that we're not being erased from these things, right? And making sure that our names are coming up in these conversations, because let's be honest, hold on a second. Yes, we are. Um, let's be honest. And a lot of these times we are thinking about 
it's mostly male scholars that are coming up. It's mostly men's names that are being dropped in these things as these, these lead thought leaders and things like that. And if sometimes if it's not for women saying, hey, what about so-and-so? They sometimes get erased from that. So we have, you know, we kind of have to keep pushing for that as well. Sorry, yeah. my kid brought me some water. <laughs> and also the as sort of leaders in, in this arena of bringing voices of women to the fore, it also promotes links with women, say the Dalit, untouchable women who mm -hmm. are murdered a few minutes and, and raped because, you know, there's such a structure, a construction, a cultural construction that you are less than human and deserve to be treated in the most vile way um, that is ongoing as we speak. And so the power of that voice is connected to those women who are silenced inside their countries, inside their religions. But the more knowledge that we receive and understand about these circumstances, the more that we can embrace their stories inside, you know, the, the here, inside temple, inside our department, so that research for the future can be influenced by areas that are not always touched. And the important thing is that, that these women are African women too, um, Kushite women, you know, women who were, that we're descended from, who were powerful women who um, contributed to social development and to ideas beyond any, much of what we're thinking today, who are now in these circumstances. Uh, and it seems likely what it is really, because that's who they were. And that's why they're being brought to, to this level. So the more that we can take our understanding beyond our borders, uh, the, the more that we can make those links and, and embrace um, our African sisters who are living in these uh, appalling beyonds, you know. And, and, and we do know that here, and in all the countries, there are sisters living in appalling conditions. But that being a, an actual religious concept where you actually practice as part of your religious belief to debase and demonize uh, these, these women. So I just threw that in there for, you know, because that's part of our... Africology discipline, you know, these are the things that, that we wish to look at and that we are looking at and that we broaden that. And now I know that we're coming close to the time and maybe past the time, but that it is the time, if you don't mind, because I haven't actually imposed it upon you yet, but would you be able to answer some questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. I do have a hard stop at one, but I can take a couple of questions for sure. You should be first if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So at this time, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat so we can read the question. Sure, thank you. May I ask a question? I, I am so profoundly... Uh, touched by this very powerful uh, discussion. But I wanted to ask, uh, given the fact that uh, women uh, are, in many cases, uh, the trainers and the educators and uh, the teachers of men, how do we uh, get uh, the mothers and the fathers, certainly, but where there are no fathers, how do we get, how do we teach our young men uh, not to erase women and not to see them as invisible? This has always been to me one of the big problems of trying to, uh, you know, figure out 
how being in a society where we've been thrust, which is essentially patriarchal and hierarchical, how do we as, uh, as communities uh, and particularly our women uh, who raise children, who raise boys, a lot of times the boys are raised by their mothers. And you can hear the expression of the athletes who say, thank you, mom, thank you, mom. But, but nevertheless, still have the same values that you find in patriarchy. I don't know whether I'm making it clear, but that's the issue that I'm wrestling no, with. I think I think that's a, a, a that's a, that's the question, right? Because I was actually I just did a um, a video, basically a video podcast yesterday, in which I said we have we have perpetually vilified the so-called um, African single mother. Mm-hmm. When we look in the United States, where Christianity was imposed upon us, mm-hmm. and uh, our women were forced to live in sin because they were not allowed to get married, mm-hmm. um, so we have perpetually been single mothers and yet you know for centuries right those single mothers who have uh born the labor force of this nation right but we're vilified for not having a husband Mm -hmm. when for centuries we were not allowed to have husbands right Mm -hmm. it's this conundrum that we've been in this crisis of consciousness and and existence where we're just kind of like all right so what are we supposed to do we do what we've always done we make do we, we come together, aunts, you know, family members, everybody comes together and we try to raise our children. I think what has happened is that, you know, when capitalism and poverty comes in, it makes it very difficult for us to cohabitate or join because then we end up losing these benefits that we need. And that's coming, you know, from sociology is understanding that impact. A lower income mother cannot get married because she'll lose her housing subsidies and food stamps and things. She can't even move in with a friend. Because if you're living with someone, you can lose those things. So we, it's like we're working within this extremely stratified system and, and, and we're not even allowing people to connect on a loving level because they're so worried about the money and the finances and how do I survive? So I think part of that is really kind of understanding that that's the key and how we are supporting mothers that find themselves in those situations and families that, I mean, cause brothers are there. There are a lot of brothers that are there. We don't see them sometimes because we can't, we're not allowed to. I know I had to pretend my dad was not around to get support to go to high school. You see what I mean? So the way that it's set up, it's like, oh no, he was there, but you weren't supposed to know that. And so we have to kind of look at that, the nuances of those things and start addressing it from there. That's policy change. We need more of us that are working on these policy changes that these policies that are directly affecting our families and our communities and really start to shift those. And then we're able to go from there and create the the communities and and things and bring our families kind of back together in that way. That's what, that's one of the first things I think about. Um, But I do have to run y'all. I love y'all so much. I'm so happy that I was here. I appreciate uh, you, Dr. Busby, Dr. Dove, always. Thank you. Santi, all of the folks that are here. uh, Toyo, thank you so much for your work on this. But I do have to go and I'll stop. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Good to meet you, Michelle. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Um, Dr. Busby, do you mind answering a question directed to you regarding your work? And okay, a specific question. Um, is any, would anyone like to ask uh, Dr. Busby? Oh, yes, I see uh, Karen Coleman, who is wonderful. Hi. Hi, Dr. Busby. Hi, Dr. Dove. Um, Yes, I'm a student in Dr. Dove's current class, The Black Woman, and we are, of course, going over your book. It Mm -hmm. is phenomenal. It's such diversity with the women that any woman on a face of planet Earth can resonate with it. But I want you to know that although your writings are great, your (laughs) beingness supersedes your writings. It just does, it's in everything about you. And I just wanted you to know that. Um, I have a quick question. I had it for Michelle, but she's not here. Um, And with anyone that could answer this, with culture vultures, what can we do as African women, African people with um, with our talents and skills and abilities, what can we do to safeguard that those things aren't misused, stolen, as they always have been in the past and continually in present time still does. What can we do 
as a people to try to safeguard that those things do not happen with our writings, even with the buzzwords, with what's trending with today's Black people. Um, what can we do as, as a people to try to safeguard that those things stop happening and that we get ownership of what it is that we do and credit for it? What can we do on our part to try to safeguard? Or is there anything that we can? can I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer to that question, aside from the fact that we, we have to always support each other, be respectful of each other, and not necessarily put ourselves in a position to compete with each other, mm. to realize that we're actually, should all be aiming for the, the same thing. And so the, the temptation to, you know, appropriate somebody else's uh, creativity should not enter into the, the, the situation at all. I mean, I, I don't think that's an answer. Maybe Dr. Dub can answer it better, but I, I haven't got a, a quick solution apart from the thing that I live by, which is supporting each other, giving each other the strength to do whatever we're doing, passing on whatever information we can that will help others and not necessarily focusing on getting the glory for ourselves. And one of the sayings I, I always mention that I live by, which is uh, an adaptation of something, I think that maybe Truman said at one point, which is, it's astonishing what you can accomplish when you don't care who takes the credit. Mm. And, you know, there may be a lot of things I've done that I get no credit for, that's fine. Because I'm doing them not to get the credit or the byline or, or the money or whatever, but because they're necessary things to do for all of us. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That very, was very helpful. Yes, truly African to the core. Um, <laughs> um, so, well, I, I thank you, Dr. Busby, for taking your important time to come here and be with us and bring us knowledge. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you. So if there's nothing left to say, I just want to say thank you very, very much. And, and we're honoured and blessed. And this is the number one, the first of the series of African womanism. And you are a wonderful example. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank you for what you're doing and for setting up this wonderful platform. Thanks, Nora. Thank I just you. wanted to know, I believe Dr. Flannery has one last question, if you are able to take that. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I'll try. <laughs> Dr. Flannery. Thank you, Toyo. Thank you, Dr. Dev and Dr. Busby. This was really, really good. I hope we have more of these. I was just thinking, um, you know, given the Africana woman paradigm that we're using here, is there a difference between illuminating women and actually resisting patriarchy? And what should we take away in terms of the specific characteristics that allow for us to resist patriarchy um, in a way that, <clears throat> there, I, I guess I'm articulating that there's ways that women have been celebrated in the midst of patriarchy. So I'm not sure if, um, bringing, allowing women to speak is the same thing as resistance. And so I'm wondering what nuances we should take away as tools um, as we advance forward. Hmm. I, I think that's the sort of question that will probably take an hour to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't think of a quick answer, but um, yes, there are nuances always. And I, I think it's important to realize that and, and not think that there's one size fits all in terms of coming up with an answer. But um, the celebrating, well, it, it, again, you can celebrate people on a personal level, you can celebrate people on, I don't do social media, but I, I guess that's another way people celebrate each other these days. But I think it's, it's a question also of appreciating what we do amongst ourselves, even though we are within a patriarchal system and not deferring to the, 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 
the, the default position where we ourselves have internalized the, the feeling that somehow men are better or no more or, or whatever. We, we have to believe in ourselves and each other before we can go beyond that. And well, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you have an answer that you can suggest to me. No? <laughs> I am learning from the greats. Um, it, it was something that I was just thinking of and I uh, hope Dr. Dove would also comment um, given the recent book release I on can, being human being too. Yes, I, I, I can uh, comment uh, in terms of it's an educational process as I see it. So, you know, we're in the privileged position to be in a department to learn through the, the theory, Afrocentric theory and the discipline, the value of humanity, the value of, of all of us as human beings. And, uh, you know, but the knowledge of our past and who we actually are is missing. And this is what we do. It, is that we go out there and, and retrieve the knowledge that has been taken away. That is our job. We can't do everything, but you know, in that area, we're, we're in a, a discipline that enables us, that encourages us to seek and find and interrogate what has happened to us while we're in these circumstances and these things that we learn we put out there and we can do that not just in writing which is what we have to do when we're in here but also in terms of the center for instance that we're going to be having in the spring that is the center that will make that link into the community and we know that um here in this community um young men of African descent who do not know that they're African, who do not know that who they are, who are seeking wealth in ways that endanger their lives that they, they don't care about, um, that to, to the center can reach educationally these minds and the minds of the young ones and so on. And this is something that we can actually do and must do. We have no choice but to do it. And I look at that educational part of it, that we are blessed to have a structure that is just grounded in truth and that we can put that message out there and, you know, make a change. This. Philadelphia, as we all know, has one of the highest uh, deaths from guns in the whole country. So, you know, this is, we, we're obliged, we must, we must tackle that in very real terms. And it's all about what we've learned and what we continue to learn it's about education, it's about culture. Dr. Doug, may I just say uh, one comment on this? Yes, please. If I may. Yeah, I just the comment I want to make uh, to Dr. Uh, Flattery's question is that uh, Afrocentricity is always a critique of domination. So the critique of domination means that it is a, always critiquing uh, oppressive conditions. So the assertion of women uh, is in itself a a positive statement, and it's a correct statement, and the support uh, of women on the part of men is actually the reality of expressing this humanity that, that you've been speaking about. But I don't think the, the way the question was phrased, I think that uh, Dr. Flannery, I think that the uh, issue of patriarchy, that that's not the same as, for example, women not necessarily complimenting men or working with men. And I think that that has to, so, so you can be against, because men don't necessarily have to be patriarchal, you see? So, so and I think that that's where uh, 
the nuances come in here that, that always though, as an Afrocentrist, we critique all forms of oppression and all forms of domination. But, uh, and so we have to critique patriarchy, particularly in that sense. Yesterday, I went to see the exhi exhibit uh, of the artist, Emma Amos. Uh, and it was very profound at the museum, uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, very profound because what she uh, articulates in her paintings is the idea that uh, being female in order to get your art exhibited and expressed, that not only must you deal with the question of being a, a woman, but you have to uh, uh, deal with the whole question of, uh, particularly if you're a black woman as, as she is or was, uh, you have to deal with the whole question of color, complexion, culture, but also you have to deal with the question of, of maleness. So it, it, it's a very complicated, but I think that the, the two things I wanted to separate was patriarchy from maleness. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, because one of the things that um, I was thinking recently is that I've noticed even among um, uh, feminism and queer studies that there's almost a passive misogyny um, that one can um, digest even as an active feminist because the same way people become anti-Black as a Black person, because if you're only presented with, this is always wrong with women, this is, we're mm -hmm. always in fear, we're always, then you would digest that as your identity. And then as a feminist, you can also be anti-woman to some degree. And so mm -hmm. I wanted the ways and the tools in which we are actually getting at the power relationship between femininity and masculinity mm -hmm. without just saying, we just need more visibility or we just need Mm -hmm. you know, sort of these surf surface sort of orientations to maleness and, and femaleness. Mm -hmm. But that was very helpful because it's, it is about the structure of the relationships. Thank you. Thank you. So um, unless anyone wants to say anything else, thank you very much, Dr. Flannery. Um, and, and Dr. Santi, thank you for your powerful input. Um, so, well, I think we can let you go and give you a round of silence applause. And thank you. Goodbye from London. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Such a pleasure and such an honor. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Toyosi, everything okay? Yes, I'm about to log out. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Dove. Be safe. You too. Thank you so much for all the imagery, taking control of here, getting us in and getting us out. Managing, you know, thank you.